words. Okay, so now I'm going to hand the mic over to Venerable Hui Feng for his opening remark as our co-host. First of all, thank you very much, Venerable Miao That was a wonderful presentation of humanistic Buddhism. What is humanism? What does that mean? And also, um, as Venerable Miao herself has said, I'm also very excited and very happy to see that in this year's um, Fawam Shan Masculine and Lay Disciple Seminar that, yeah, we've got a whole panel going on here in English. So all, my, all my many years of participating, um, a very delightful and unexpected occasion. So I'm very happy to see you all here. Um, thank you for our panel who came along, just sort of rather short notice. Um, it's good to see that in our audience we have a few elders. We've got Venerable Zhu with us and Venerable Yitao with us. Um, and we've also got, probably compared to the other groups, a bit of a younger group as well, particularly students from Buddhist College. So it's really great to see you all here, to come together and discuss humanistic Buddhism, holding true to the original intents of the Buddha. It's a very important work by Venerable Master. Um, as Venerable Melbourne said, we can look at it as a Bible for humanistic Buddhism, and when she mentioned that, a few people But remember, where does the word Bible come from? It, it just means book, right? It's like a, the book. If in the future people are wanting to say, okay, I'm interested in Fogong Shan, I'm interested in Buddha Light, I'm interested in what you have to say about humanistic Buddhism, but what should I read? There's a lot of different books on a different material, which one? At the moment, this, I believe, is our best go-to source for a number of reasons. It has the theoretical outline and the structure in it. That's one very important thing to put it, you know, in a very systematic and structured way. Secondly, it has the historical content from talking about the Buddha himself and his time in ancient India and how all that works. This is the source of our teachings. Um, but not just ancient history, but the development up into the present. And then, of course, the doctrines and the teachings of humanistic Buddhism as well. So this is a very excellent source. And we can see from Venerable Miao Guang's um, explanation, he's like the kind of our, our, our humanistic um, Buddhism ananda, right? <laughs> Not, not the Buddha's attendant, not Venerable Master's attendant, but his translator. I'm sure if uh, the Buddha needed a translator, <laughs> probably find some uh, past incarnation of Venerable Miao Guang here. <laughs> okay, now my part is to, um, now since you've all got your copies of the book, if you'd like to just open it up to page 13, but it's the, the, the Roman numeral, XIII, right? XIII. So it's got our lovely picture there of the Buddha Memorial Center. The preface is called My Understanding About Humanistic Buddhism. The my, of course, refers to Shifu's understanding. Um, we have a very interesting challenge for just this group. The other sessions, of course, are discussing the same book. Um, we have a unique challenge in that the, the, the book itself, of course, is originally in Chinese and is, is facing a lot of issues, not just in Chinese Buddhism, but that's definitely a part of it. But we have the extra challenge of then taking that across cultures, right? So we've kind of got a, another little element that maybe the other groups don't have to face so much. So we're gonna, I'm gonna also try to touch on this as well. I don't think we have the slides up here. Okay, can we zip on to the next slide, please? Um, this starts, as we can see at the top of this page, right? and we can read together here. As far as humanistic Buddhism has developed, many queries about this teaching exist and await clarification. I hereby list a few of them. And this comes back, as was just mentioned, um, a lot of the, 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 the starting of writing this came from a the second symposium on humanistic Buddhism, which was um, held in December last year. Um, we had a number of scholars here. I was also there presenting as well in the localization of all things. And you could see among the scholars, scholars can be pretty hard 
you can be pretty critical. They will ask demanding questions. And these were some of the questions or the types of questions that we saw there. Now, there are eight in total, as you can see, it goes over to the top of the next page. I've kind of reduced them down to a couple. So the first one that I would like to, to sort of present is the question of, is humanistic Buddhism just some kind of secular movement? Just some kind of mundane thing? Now this term secular and mundane, of course in the Buddhist sense, has its own very specific meanings. Um, if you want to get to the source, when Buddhists talk about secular or mundane, what do they mean? Samsara. Cyclic existence. Suffering. So the question is not that humanistic Buddhism is all about suffering, but, okay, you do all these things in humanistic Buddhism, but aren't they just kind of doing good in society, but it's still just regular human social interaction? Which brings us to our next question, of course, the flip side, which is, what elements of humanistic Buddhism do we see that are transcendental or liberating? Because for probably the majority of Buddhists, this is like the cutting point between Buddhist teachings and not just um, secular or worldly teachings, but even other religions. From a Buddhist point of view, even theistic religion is ultimately worldly because it involves this continual cycle of existence and birth and death and so on and so forth. But does humanistic Buddhism really have a, a way to the deliberation? Is it really a way to have it? It's the sorts of questions that come up and the, the big questions. These are not minor questions. These are very big ones. Because to many people, if you don't have this, then can we, can we even Buddhism at all. And another one, as I said, these are just these are just kind of um, my summary of these kind of eight points here. The third one is in what is the lineage, what is the, the heritage of humanistic Buddhism? When I say, oh yeah, sure you put Buddhism on it and you do all these, you have these external trappings, but how much of it is just and then why? How much of this is just your own creation? That's just what you say. Where can we find the sources of this in the Buddha's words, the Buddha's teachings, and the teachings of the great um, teachers and leaders of Buddhism from India to China, from past to the present? Can we see those? Because, as was also mentioned here, lineage is very important. You know, there's many, there's many religious teachings in the world that come up, lots of new things, someone, everyone's got some new idea, but we want something that's been tried and tested to be shown to be true over a long time. That's something that gives us a lot of faith and confidence. So, does your humanistic Buddhism have a lineage or a tradition? So these are the sorts of questions that were being raised at that conference, at that symposium, but not just then. These are questions that have probably been raised back from when? Probably from the time of the Buddha. Sure. It's probably the sorts of questions that people used to ask the Buddha himself, to be honest. Now, if you go on to page 14, XIV, Shifu doesn't just start to answer this. He doesn't just jump in and provide an answer. But he provides a little bit of a background here. And I'd like to just flesh this out a little bit more. Um, the audience was mainly from Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, mainland China. Um, but from my own point of view, yeah, even when I first encountered Pro Long Shan, I studied at African Buddhist Seminary, um, and then later here at Tsongyam. And we you know, had this term humanistic and humanistic Buddhism. And I had similar sorts of questions, particularly about why do we use the term it wasn't until a bit later that I really spent some time understanding what is it, Ming Qing Buddhism. So Buddhism in China in the last few hundred years, um, we had the perceptions of Buddhism back in the golden age of China, you know, the golden age of China.
my master Hui Meng and Ma Tzu and these people all are very resplendent. And, but it wasn't always like that. And for the last few hundred years, the Ming and Qing dynasties, Buddhism was not in good shape. And it started to develop a few, a few problems. So what were some of these problems here? So you look rising time. What were some of these problems here? We have the next slide up. One was what I would call a socially disconnected Buddhism. Now we know, for example, the Confucian traditions have a lot of guidelines for social harmony. Relationships between the emperor and the ministers, relationships between husband and wife, relationships between um, siblings, brothers and sisters, uh, between parents and children. Buddhism came along, and Buddhism also has these teachings. But from the Chinese side, it was often thought that the Confucian model was there, and thus this element of Buddhism was played down more and more, until Buddhism was purely this idea of you must leave society. If you want to be Buddhist, you have to become a monastic. You must go out into the wilds, up in the mountains, and you never come down. And it has been the case in history, monastics were not allowed in the city, they were barred from going into the towns and cities. And of course this then created very much a socially disconnected Buddhism. And this is not what the Buddha taught, this is not how the Buddha acted, or how he lived. Another type of problem we had was what we could call the deification of Buddhism. A kind of a philosophically disconnected the Buddha was a human being. He was a very special human Buddha. You have a very great term for this. I can't remember what that term is. Extraordinarily human. I love that phrase. Extraordinarily human. Human, yes. Not some regular schmuck like me, but extraordinarily human. Um, but over time, there are elements that really made the Buddha not extraordinarily human, but something much more like a god. Sort of had all these, you know, omnipotent and so on and so forth. And this created this, this, this big gap between us as Buddhists and the Buddha himself and put the Buddha and Buddhahood really beyond our reach. The Buddha was so other and so different from us. And people looking to the Buddha that the Buddha will help me, the Buddha will save me, putting my reliance on something other than myself. It's kind of a philosophically disconnected Buddhism, a kind of a deification of the Buddha. And we have one more point here. Or maybe we don't. Okay. Now this brings us then into our responses from Shifu. It's on page 15 and through the next couple of pages. Again, I hope you can read these yourself, but I just want to do a couple of key points. If we can have the next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? Okay. First point, as already mentioned. Against the idea of Buddha as some supernormal power that can liberate us, no. We turn to some of the Buddha's very last words. Rely on yourself. Rely on the Dharma, the teachings, and what is good and right. Don't rely on anything else. I mean, don't rely on, in a sense, the Buddha. In a sense. So again, this is very much against the idea, in the West, of humanism was against theistic religion, where it's the power of Christ and the power of God that saves us. No, it's ourselves. It's ourselves. Second point. Why can we save ourselves? Core doctrinal idea. Dependent origination. Emptiness. All our afflictions, all our problems, all the confusion that we have, our pride, our jealousy, our anger, and so forth. Yet we have these things, but they are not inherent in us. Everything can be changed. Not only can we change our emotions, we can change what country we come from. Next life, you can change. You want to be a, you, you're a man, you want to be a woman, you're a woman, you want to be a man, we can change that. Gender can be changed. You can change your species. You want to be a cat in your next life? You can do it. I don't encourage you to, but you can do it. If even your species can be changed, your gender can be changed, what's to say about our ignorance and about our afflictions? And again, it's ourselves. We have the power to change ourselves. Jesus' core idea of dependent origination. This is 
called doctrine aspect. And one last bit here. Because of that potential, we also can become a Buddha. We are potential Buddhas right now. So again, another core doctrine of humanistic Buddhism. We all have that power. Now that again brings us back to the humanism side. We can have the one last slide here. In theistic religions, or in a deified Buddhism, the difference between the mundane and the transmundane, they are different things. They are opposites of each other. God is the transcendent, humans are the mundane. If, however, we as human beings all have the potential for liberation, the transcendent liberation is also within our own power. There's no difference in that regard with respect to being human and the mundane and the transcendent. And this idea of non-duality, again, core Buddhist teaching and a core deep, deep level idea that holds humanism. No, I can say much more about these points here. However, we've got such a wonderful panel, and they're all eager to take the microphone and share with you. So, <laughs> okay, so that's my little bit on the preface. I hope you can check that out later on. For now, we're going to turn it back over to our first panelist, Venerable Miyabang, if you'd like to do the introduction. Okay. Thank you very much, Venerable Hui Fong, for this solid understanding on the core concepts and how we can actually begin to understand humanistic Buddhism. And now we're going to hand the mic over to our panelists. I know the time is limited, so we're only giving them each 10 minutes to cover a whole chapter and also provide their perspectives. Sorry to do that to you.